I want to welcome you all to today's Aspen Institute Congressional Briefing, and we're titled Looking Ahead, the Savings Policy Landscape for 2014. I'm Lisa Mensa, the founder and director of Aspen's Initiative on Financial Security. And I want to tell you, this is a great room in Washington. You're going to have 90 minutes, a sandwich, a drink, and the best dialogue on savings and retirement and progress that you can have in this town. We're going to hear soon from Senator Hatch and later from Senator Cardin. And then Senator Chris Murphy will join us uh, a little later on. So we've got a series of distinguished senators. I also have a distinguished panel. Andrea Levere, the president of CFED. Uh, in for Chris Marks is Bob Doyle of Chris Marks. Unfortunately, the head of Prudential's retirement division was stuck in the weather uh, fog this morning. And then also Deborah Whitman, the executive vice president for policy, strategy, and international affairs at AARP. So I will give more of an extensive bio and after the senators give their remarks. I want to start uh, with an introduction uh, to uh, Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, who we're very pleased to have with us. Senator Hatch is now in his seventh term as Utah's senior senator, and he is the most senior Republican in the Senate. He is the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Finance and is also a member of the Judiciary Committee, of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, of the Joint Committee on Taxation, and of the Special Committee on Aging. Senator Hatch has been a leader on savings policy for many years. He chaired the HELP Committee from 1981 to 1987 and advanced important savings policies, including the Retirement Equity Act of 1984. We are really pleased, Senator Hatch, that you can join us today, and I'd like the room to join me in welcoming Senator Hatch to the podium. Well, thank you, so mu thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me okay. I want to thank uh, the Aspen Institute for holding this uh, important meeting to, on financial security and savings policy and for inviting me here today. And also my friend Ben Cardin. Uh, he's, uh, I'll mention him a little bit later in my remarks. <laughs> financial security and retirement policy in, uh, in particular have never been more important than they are right now. The good news is that the private employer-based pension system has become the greatest wealth creator for the middle class in history, especially through the 401k plans and individual retirement accounts, or IRAs. And despite the ups and downs of the stock market and historically low interest rates, millions of Americans have managed to save trillions of dollars for retirement. The bad news is that the retirement of the baby boom generation is pulling enormous or putting enormous pressure on public programs like Social Security and Medicare. On top of that, the constant search for revenue up here on Capitol Hill has led some to propose reductions in contributions to 401k plans and IRAs. That, in my opinion, would be both short-sighted and foolish. Some have forgotten that Congress has already covered this ground. We already made this policy call. In 2001, Congress increased the limits for contributions to 401ks and IRAs. At the time, 401k contributions were limited to $10,500 per year, and IRAs were limited to $2,000. This year, workers that are 50 or older may contribute up to $23,000 to a 401k. An older individual may contribute up to $6,500 to the IRA. The key to successful retirement savings is participation by employees in a plan at work. And the key to convincing employers to sponsor a plan is a healthy contribution limit. Here's what Congress concluded in 2001 as reported in the Blue Book published by the Joint Committee on Taxation. Quote, the Congress believed that increasing the dollar limits on qualified plan contributions and benefits would encourage employers to establish qualified plans for their employees. The Congress understood that in recent years, Section 401k plans have become increasingly more prevalent. The Congress believed it was important to increase the amount of employee elective deferrals allowed under such plans and other plans that allow deferrals to better enable plan participants to save for their retirement, unquote. 
Well, it worked. Since 2000, retirement assets in defined contribution, plan, uh, contrib uh, defined contribution, defined contribution plans have grown from $3 trillion to $5.1 trillion despite the market downturn in 2008. Assets in IRAs have, go have grown from $2.6 trillion to $5.4 trillion. In fact, increased contribution limits worked so well that in 2006, Congress made th those provisions permanent. The vote in the Senate to make them permanent was overwhelming 93 to 5. My good friend Senator Cardin of Maryland had a major role in those reforms. I thank him for that, and I look forward to work, uh, working with him to preserve these policies. And if anyone says that uh, graduates of the University of Pittsburgh can't amount to anything, <laughs> you can look to Senator Cardin and myself, <laughs> especially Senator Cardin. But we don't have to play pension policy defense all the time. We can also play offense. What we need are new ideas to encourage employers who do not currently sponsor plans to start doing so. That's why last year I introduced legislation to uh, create the Starter 401k, a plan designed for small or startup businesses that are not in a position to contribute to a plan but want to help their employees save. A Starter 401k is a new kind of plan that allows employees under 50, under age 50, uh, to save up to $8,000 per year, much more than in an IRA, but does not involve the administrative burden or expense of a traditional or 401k plan. Of course, we cannot talk about retirement savings without discussing the importance of lifetime income. All of the policy efforts we have fought for over the years to encourage greater savings come, can come undone if the assets accumulated for retirement run out before the end of uh, your life. Now that's why the legislation I introduced last year encourages the purchase of annuity contracts for retirement. Now in fact, the bill is called the Secure Annuities for Employment Retirement Act, or the SAFE Retirement Act. Uh, why life insurance annuity contracts? Well, lifetime income is a form of life insurance. We tend to think of life insurance as insurance against the risk of living an unexpectedly short life. And that is certainly true. But life insurance also includes insurance for the possibility that we might live an unexpectedly long life. There are those around here who think I've lived much longer than I should. I personally resent that attitude. <laughs> So it only makes sense to encourage the use of annuities to provide retirement security, and my legislation does that. It does so in two ways. First, we remove obstacles to adding annuity purchase options to 401k plans. Under my bill, a participant can use up to 25% of a 401k account balance to purchase an annuity that begins payments as late is age 85. Now you might say, isn't that kind of long since life expectancy, when I got elected, it was uh, for males about 73 or 74 years of age, females just slightly larger, or longer, I should say. But today, if you live a re in relatively good health to age 84, you're going to live to 100 in most cases. In fact, we now have a million people who are 100. And we expect millions over the next number of years with better health care, better approaches towards health, with stem cell research, personal medicine, various uh, uh, medical devices, and uh, really good pharmaceuticals. We expect people to live much longer lives, and especially if you live good lives. So first, like I say, we remove obstacles to adding annuity purchase options to 401k plans. And like I say, under my bill, a participant could use up to 25% of a 401k account balance to purchase an annuity that begins payments as late as age 85. Second, we provide employers a liability safe harbor 
as long as the annuity contract is treated as life insurance under state law. So in short, under my bill, employers are encouraged to add annuity options to their plans, and employees are encouraged to use them. The Safe Retirement Act also tackles one of the most re pressing retirement problems facing the country, and that's the problem of poorly funded state and local pension plans. We are all painfully aware of the crises uh, unfolding in the Detroit bankruptcy, and, and Detroit is not alone. From Rhode Island to Illinois to California, the crisis is getting worse every day. And as I've said before, America cannot continue to ignore the financial disaster coming our way if we do not get our public pension debt crisis under control. I also have said that a federal bailout of state and local governments is fraught with risks and so-called moral hazard. Frankly, a bailout is a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. If state and local government pension plan administrators believe there is an implicit federal guarantee on their pensions, they have a built-in incentive to take more risks than they otherwise would. Moreover, federal bailouts of state and local pensions would ultimately put innocent taxpayers across the country on the hook for poorly run pension plans in other states. But saying that Congress will not bail out a state or local government is not to say that Congress should do nothing. Congress can, and in my opinion should, enact policies that will help cities and towns help themselves to get back to fiscal health or avoid becoming unhealthy in the first place. The Safe Retirement Act is just such a policy. In a safe retirement plan, employers purchase annuity contracts for their employees each year in order to even out the effect of changing in, uh, interest rates. Pension costs are stable and affordable, and employees receive annuity contracts for lifetime pensions that are fully portable. That's pretty important as well. 100% vested and can never be underfunded. Life insurance annuity contracts also have a financial backstop. Unlike state and local government pensions, uh, they have a better backup. And one more thing. The Safe Retirement Act creates a pension that is not subject to reduction by a federal bankruptcy court. That is a tremendous advantage. That's right. State-based life insurance contracts are not subject to federal banks bankruptcy proceedings. Given what we're seeing in cities like Detroit, that fact alone should lead Congress to take a new look at this tried and true method of securing lifetime pensions. A safe retirement plan can be a first step, and I'm, that's SAFE retirement plan, can be a first step that governments can take as they begin the process of stopping the bleeding, riding the ship, and beginning the journey, journey back to solvency and sustainability. Let me close my remarks by again thanking the Aspen Institute for convening this event. Policy discussions like these can be very helpful to those of us in Congress trying to put the right policies in place. And as you discuss policies to help people save for their retirement, remember that people also need better tools to help them stretch their retirement assets over increasingly longer lifespans. Let me just say that some have said, well, what about the insurance companies? Are they going to go broke? Well, the fact of the matter is they have a much better record than almost any other financial group over time and over the years. And so we're very, very, very positive in trying to come up with this type of an approach that I think will avoid some of the disasters that we have in the, going on in this country right now. And especially in Detroit, California, Illinois, and some of these other, and well, even Rhode Island and some other states as well. I, I didn't mean to pick on those particular states particularly. So uh, for those of you who belong to them, uh, I'm giving you a way out. <laughs> and you ought to pay attention to it. And if you don't, you're going to be sorry. So we need your help in seeing that we get this type of legislation through that makes such such common sense and such financial sense. 
I'm just appreciative of the Aspen Institute. Uh, they do an awful lot of good things in our society here. And I'm grateful to you inviting me here today. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Senator Hatch has a vote, so we are going to let him do the people's business and uh, invite those of you who didn't get a seat but have a sandwich to come take a few of the seats up front. Senator Hatch really started us off well because he not only said why this savings policy landscape question is so important now, um, but he gave us some hope. I uh, appreciate his sense that uh, we have visited these policy uh, fields before and we can in the future. And I think you're going to hear many echoes of that uh, through our briefing. Um, we're going to, we always say at the Aspen Institute, it's more like jazz rather than a marching band. So uh, we're switching up the order a little. We are waiting for uh, Senator uh, Cardin to come in. I'm going to go ahead and give uh, my uh, a few more remarks about this event, and I will introduce my panelists, and uh, we'll start our panel unless Senator Cardin walks in, and then we'll, I will introduce Senator Cardin. So let me remind you again why we decided to have this event in, in January of 2014, and why we would even care about 2014. There's a cynicism in Washington that this is a year legislatively that nothing will happen. And yet those who know deeper know that existing policies like retirement and savings are already, uh, are, are already on the books and that many changes are possible. Part of the great debates of our moment are about opportunity and about closing inequality gaps. And you heard Senator Hatch remarked, that in some ways we've made huge gains for many in the middle class uh, through our savings policies and through the uh, benefits we provide through our tax code. So this topic today really relates to that whole uh, issue. Also, savings policies have tremendous appeal to bipartisan values. Those of you who know Aspen Institute know that that is our zone. We really appreciate when we can have a bipartisan dialogue about something, and today's briefing proves it. We aren't going to get the photo op we wanted with both a Republican and a Democratic senator here at the same time, but they're on the same issue, and I think you will hear uh, the similarities and parts of common ground and where they differ. The other theme of today that I think you'll hear from all of our panels is that there are ways that where modest changes will make a huge difference. And you'll hear this in some of our uh, panelists. Those of you who follow those issue, these issues of savings and those of you who are new to them will hear the themes of what we can do in the American workplace to expand more savings. You'll hear things, tools about tax time savings. Uh, Aspen was uh, and part of saving Senator uh, Congressman Cartwright of Pennsylvania has talked about expanding what we can do with uh, tax time savings bonds, and those are ideas which are in front of us. And there are always ideas to extend the matching incentives. So without further ado, I want to explain who are the voices to my left here, who are really some powerful voices on this issues. I want to start by introducing Deborah Whitman. She's the Executive Vice President for Policy and Strategy and International Affairs for AARP. Deborah leads policy development in retirement security and in healthcare and in consumer protections and other issues for AARP. Previously, she served as the staff director for the Special Committee on Aging here in the Senate. So welcome back to the Senate, Deb, and we're looking forward to your remarks. Uh, we also have an important voice from Prudential Retirement, and it is Bob Doyle. And Bob is standing in for the president of Prudential Retirement, Christine Marks, whose bios you have on your chair. Bob joined uh, Prudential's Government Affairs Office in March of 2011 to serve as a legislative and regulatory strategist on retirement issues. And Prudential was called the winner uh, because uh, for 20 years, uh, Bob has served as the Director of Regulations and Interpretations for the Employee Benefits Security Administration of the Department of Labor. And there he was responsible for carrying out the Department of Labor responsibilities under the ERISA, or retirement, the Employee Retirement and Income Security Act. So Bob is truly an expert on these issues. 
Uh, he's joined us at many other Aspen events, and Bob, we really appreciate you standing in uh, due to the weather delays, which we all understand, uh, but we welcome you. And finally, Andrea Levere. Andrea has led the Corporation for Enterprise Development, CFED, as its president since 2004. CFED is a private nonprofit organization with the mission of building assets and expanding economic opportunity for low income people and disadvantaged communities throughout the US. And they do this by focusing on match savings, entrepreneurship, and affordable housing. Uh, we've worked closely with CFED as they have designed and operated major initiatives uh, that aim to expand match savings for, mat for children and youth and bring self-employed entrepreneurs into the mainstream. Uh, we are pleased that Andrea is with us today, and I think you brought some of your materials. Uh, this is what I noted before. This is the shortcut to really a powerful discussion. So I uh, want to thank all the panelists, and I want to begin, uh, Deb. Uh, Deborah Whitman, if you could come to the podium and begin our discussion. Thanks, Lisa, and it's great to be here as an alum. I'm sensitive to the fact that I've stood in the back of the room holding my lunch, and there are about four or five seats here if anybody is uh, interested or willing to come forward. Um, I also really appreciate the fact that there are so many um, both political leaders that you'll see at the podium, um, but staff here, because I think this is not only an important issue, as you'll see, to the American population, this is an important issue um, in debate with your constituents um, as an election issue. And I'm going to make three basic points. Um, First of all, the lack of savings is an issue that's only going to grow in importance over time. And I don't like to use the word crisis about things um, because I think that's too often used. But I, I do believe that we're in um, an era where if we don't do something now, the long-term consequences will be severe. The, the second point is that it's solvable. There are policy solutions. You heard um, Senator Hatch give a whole list of them from his perspective. There are other bills that are out there, so there are solutions to this problem. And third is the public cares about it. Um, they care a great deal. There's a lot of angst out there, and as uh, representative for AARP, I can tell you we hear from it on a daily basis. Um, so to start, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be from ARP if I didn't bring up the importance of Social Security, even in something about savings, um, because it really is the basis for most people's financial security in retirement. But it's not enough. Nowhere near enough. The average benefit is uh, less than $15,000 a year. And that's not enough to live on. So most people know that they are going to have to provide for their own futures, and what we need to do is give them the opportunity to do so. So as I said, I'm not using the word crisis, um, but let me just give you a little bit of backdrop for the situation that most people face. The first most important point is nearly half of all workers don't have access to save through their employers. And you heard Senator Hatch say just a few minutes ago that saving through your employment is really the foundation of having a secure retirement. Um, the, the second, and um, this is really sad, that four in 10 workers that are near retirement, age 45 to 64, actually have nothing set aside for retirement savings. Nothing. And so let's look at the half that did put some aside and see how they're doing. Half of those have less than $44,000 a year. So we have not enough people saving and those that are, are simply not saving enough. I'm going to put a pause on my rest of my <laughs> remarks um, because there's no way to overshadow uh, oh, no. Senator Cardin, um, and I want to make sure that he has the opportunity to speak with us. So I'm, I'm happy to fill in back, when, back later. Sure. Deb, we're gonna, it's a good place to pause because Deb just gave us the... Uh, Shocking stat that in the savings challenge, half haven't saved, and those who have have reached a modest goal, 44,000. Somebody who's thought about these topics for much of his congressional and Senate career is Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. And we welcome you back to Aspen, Senator Cardin. It is a delight to have you here. Uh, Senator Cardin was first elected to the Senate in 2006. And before that, he represented Maryland's third congressional district since 1987. 
He serves on currently the Finance, Foreign Relations, Environment and Public Works, and Small Business Committees. Uh, he is known and known to many of you in this room for his command of pension and of health care legislation. Many of his financial proposals have been enacted into law, including his leadership in strengthening retirement policies. The Economic Growth Tax Relief and Reconciliation Act, known by that friendly acronym as EDSTRA in 2001, uh, was more familiarly known as the Portman Carden Act. And it is this work that has uh, drawn us to call on him on numerous occasions. So, Senator Cardin, we welcome you to this event. We welcome a few remarks, and I understand you're going to stay for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Lisa, thank you very much. And to Aspen, thank you for hosting this uh, discussion on retirement and, and income uh, savings. Appreciate it very much. Uh, it's remarkable you come here and the Senate gets things done. We're voting on a, <laughs> we're going to pass a budget, an omnibus budget bill. We give you all credit for it. This, this is a unique day. So maybe that's a good sign. I know my, my good friend Senator Hatch was here a little while ago. I saw him passing as I was coming. He was going to vote. And we are good friends. Uh, we come from different political uh, uh, perspectives, but we do believe in, uh, to work together to try to do something about savings in, in America. So uh, I thank you for that. I know you have the real experts here who can give you all the details. I first want to take you back about 15 years ago, because I think it's, it, it's it instructive as to how we need to proceed today. Fifteen years ago, I was a member of the House of Representatives. Rob Portman was a member of the House of Representatives. We both were serving on the Ways and Means Committee. And we were sitting in hearings listening to some of the statistics that you're hearing today. And we were somewhat am amazed at how poorly Americans were saving. Now, take you back 15 years ago, it's a different economic time than it is today. Our economy was booming. In fact, at one of the hearings, uh, the witness said, America leads every industrial nation in the world in economic growth in every single category, except for one. That one being savings. During the best of times, we weren't savings. In fact, we even had negative savings. And the worst part was in retirement savings, where Americans were, were not prepared for their retirement needs. Now, we were told in those days that, well, the savings rates really are not reflective of what Americans are doing because they're really saving through the growth of equity in their homes. And we saw what happened to that. So we don't save very much. It's part of, uh, of the impetuous nature of Americans. We like, we like to do things. And we need to do a better job on savings. So Congressman Portman and I got together, a group, and it wasn't really two people, it was a process. All the stakeholders were present, and many are, are represented in this room today. And they listened, and they understood that we were going to come to a consensus. You wouldn't get everything that you wanted, but our objective was to improve retirement security and savings for all Americans. And that process was truly nonpartisan, not really bipartisan. I remember very vividly trying to defend Congressman Portman in the Democratic caucus and him trying to defend me in the Republican caucus. It, some days it wasn't safe for the two of us to be seen together because of the partisan division in Congress. But we stuck to what we needed to get done. And it was very interesting because we came out with proposals that were enacted into law, even though the leadership of both parties didn't embrace what we were doing. If you recall, at that time, uh, President Reagan came in with his tax reform proposals. Uh, President Bush, excuse me, came in with his tax reform proposals, and it did not include uh, the retirement security issues. Uh, later, President Clinton did not embrace this. Why? Because they said, look, we're dealing with personal uh, issues. We're not dealing with the business issue. We said, well, retirement savings deals with individuals. And we were successful. And I remember when we finally came together with a bill, and Bill Thomas, the chairman of the Judiciary, uh, Ways and Means Committee, finally agreed that he would take a vote on our bill. He says, let's have a vote. And Congressman Portman and I said, we want a hearing first. He said, what? We want a hearing. He said, well, people come out and testify against it. We had a hearing. No one testified against it. Passed overwhelmingly in the committee. 
and passed by an incredibly large vote, over 400 in the House of Representatives. And what did it do? Well, it significantly improved the ability of individuals to save for their retirement. It increased limits. Why are limits important? For many reasons. One, it's a modest amount of money to start off with. And if you're going to try to accumulate enough for retirement security, increasing it helps. Secondly, for small businesses, the decision on whether to go into a plan depends on whether it's worthwhile or not. And all their employees will suffer if there's no plan at all. So it made sense to increase the limits. And then we did something known as a catch-up contribution, which particularly helped women. Because many women entered the workforce at a much later period, after they raised their families. So we did, that allowed for, for more money to be put away for retirement. We, we developed what's known as portability among the different plans. I call it the Deborah Carden provision, after my daughter, who at the age of 22 had already worked for four employers, had four different retirement plans, all different. And uh, she was, would have withdrawn that, but for the fact that she knew her father was involved in retirement security and, <laughs> and I was still paying some of her expenses. So uh, she kept the retirement plans, but we allowed for the portability. Uh, we simplified plans with safe harbor provisions. We dealt with financial literacy, a cr really critically important point. De dealt with automatic enrollment. That was a real eye-opener for us. It is amazing how many decisions are made by Americans by inaction. And the automatic enrollment provisions have worked dramatically to increase the number of participants in uh, retirement plans. Uh, so we, we, we came together, we got that passed, and as you know, the provisions were the first in the uh, tax reform acts that was made permanent. And we're very proud about that. And it's now the law. So where are we today? You've heard, you started to hear the numbers from Deborah as to where we are on uh, retirement savings. You know how few Americans still, how many Americans today are, are ill-prepared for retirement security. The savers credit that we also passed back then, very important, because we found out another important point, and that is Americans will not just use the tax deferral will not be enough for a large number of Americans. They, they have to have money on the table. And the best way to get money on the table is for an employer to sponsor a plan. The thrift savings plan for federal employees, very popular, high participation. Why? Federal workers don't want to leave money on the table. Yes, they get the tax advantage of deferral, but that would not be enough. Having money on the table works. And for the, for the savers credit, the government puts money on the table for low-wage workers. Six million Americans have taken advantage of the savers credit. It's worked. So now, as we look at what we can do today, recognizing we still have a long way to go, we need to look at the environment in which we're operating. We're in a slowdown of the economy. It's not growing as fast. It's, it's actually picking up now, but it's not growing as fast as we would like it. So it's, it's a tough economic environment to have made strong advancements on trying to take money out of the economy when we're trying to put money into the economy. And also, the, the number one challenge we have today is predictability. And today, we, this week, we're going to help. We really will help with the passage of the omnibus appropriation bill. That's, that's a major step forward. But we still don't have a long-term budget answer for this country. And we still have not dealt with entitlement spending, and we haven't dealt with the tax code. And we're going to get to those subjects. And when we start talking about the tax code, what will happen to the incentives that we currently have in the tax code that encourages savings? So first and foremost, my first strategy is to do no harm as we go through tax reform to preserve the tools that we currently have available that help people save, particularly retirement savings. And I must tell you, uh, Senator Baucus has held many hearings on tax reform over the last several years. And I've been at every one since I've been on the committee. And it, uh, it's been raised at every one of those hearings that it would be counterproductive to our long-term fiscal needs to deal with the deferral issue. Because what you're really doing is taking short-term income and just compound the long-term financial problems of our country. It's a timing issue. And our fiscal needs are more long-term than they are short-term. So I think that point has resonated, and we've made, made that point over and over again. And as you look at some of the discussion drafts, and you listen to the hearings, and as you listen to the discussions that are taking place, and I could share with you some of the discussions 
that have taken place inside the, the committee uh, as we've talked tax reform, there appears to me to be an understanding uh, that we do not want to reduce the incentives that are in the tax code uh, that help uh, people put money away for retirement. But remember, when you're looking at trying to reduce rates and you're looking at the big numbers that bring in savings under CBO scoring, these issues are always going to be on the table. So we have to be pretty strong in our, in our aggressive attitude to prevent that from happening. But it's now time to do better. And what can we do to improve the current circumstances? And that's why I'm working with Cong Senator Portman, working with Senator Hatch, working with other members of the committee to see whether we can come up with a strategy. And I did submit during the, the tax reform discussions of the Finance Committee several proposals to advance uh, retirement savings today, to build on the savers credit, to make it stronger, to build on automatic enrollment, to make that stronger, uh, and default options, and to deal with one of the major problems that I see, and that is that people just run out of money because they take the retirement funds out for uh, either in cash or for other purposes. 25% of the 401k recipients have taken money out for other than retirement. If I was redrafting these laws today, I'd make it much more difficult. Why? 401k is supposed to be retirement. You want to have money in for health care, have a health care savings account. You need a college, have a college savings account. You want to buy a home, let's do something to encourage home ownership, but leave retirement money for retirement. So we've got to do a better job to provide incentives for lifetime income options. And we're looking at ways that we can encourage more lifetime income options so people don't outlive uh, their, their income flow. It's one of the, we also need to continue to work on financial literacy. I think we're making progress in our, uh, in our K through 12. I think they're very serious about adding much more sophistication to basic uh, savings issues, but we still have to do a much better job with the workforce and do a much better job in our community on, uh, on, on, on those issues. Now, let me just um, mention one other matter. Uh, our focus should be on reality, uh, what's going to happen in 2014, what may happen in the next couple years. And reality is that we have to, those of us who are concerned about improving savings in this country, need to protect the tools that are available and try to improve those tools. And, I, and that's where I hope your focus will be in context of the budget debates that are taking place in the Congress of the United States and the tax reform debates that are taking place in the United States. But I hope you would be a little bit more visionary. And I have, will have put on the table and will continue to promote a major restructuring of our tax that would encourage savings. And I do that through a progressive consumption tax, replacing a good part of our income tax. And, and let me just give you one fact that you th should think about. And that is, among all the industrial nations in the world, the United States is near the bottom as far as the amount we rely upon government to provide services to our people. Most industrial nations are much more socialized than America is. They provide more health care, more education, more housing through government than we do. As a result, they have a higher dependency upon revenues on their economy than America does. So why does America have the highest marginal tax rates in the industrial world? And the reason is quite simple. We rely on income as our primary source of revenue. The rest of the industrial world relies on consumption. When we developed the world trade regime, America was slow on the debate. We felt we were so strong we didn't have to worry about equalizing the tax consequences. As a result, consumption taxes are border adjusted. Income taxes are not. We've tried to deal with that through a manufacturing credit, but it's been rough justice. It hasn't really, it's not very efficient. And it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. So the discussion taking place in Congress today is how can we get our corporate tax rates lower? How can we get our personal income tax rates lower? And we talk about spreading the burden more. We tried that in 1986, it lasted one year before Congress started fooling around again. Why not make a dramatic change and conform with the rest of the industrial economies. We are in a global economy. 
We have to compete globally. So my proposal would reduce the income tax rates in America to the lowest among the industrial nations of the world. We would have a consumption tax that would be at the lowest of the industrial nations of the world. And we should be as more competitive on the tax costs of producing products in America on the global stage. And I can go into a lot of detail as to how I configure that, how we make it progressive so that it's even more progressive than our current tax code uh, by exempting a certain level of consumption and making sure consumers have that uh, available to them immediately and how we deal at the upper end with a simplified income tax code uh, that not only produces the revenue and the progressivity but simplifies dramatically our tax code. Uh, we also deal with the revenue issues to make sure that it is a, a revenue neutral proposal so that particularly from the Republican side, it does not become a, a new revenue source, but rather a substitute revenue source. So this is an area that I'm going to be talking about. I said in re the world of reality, it's not going to happen in 2014. It's not going to be signed by President Obama this year. There's no, this is an area that I hope we will get to in the next Congress in a serious way. I intend to try to advance it as far as I can this year, but uh, I hope that we can get serious debate about real reform of our tax code that will not only help and reward savings and investment in America, but make us more competitive on the global stage. I, when I look in this room and I see the people, who I've, many of whom I've worked with for a long time, it really does give me optimism that we're going to figure this out. So let, let me just end on an optimistic note. And that is this past Thursday, uh, the Democratic caucus in the Senate met with Ben Bernanke, the outgoing chair of the Federal Reserve System. And he was very optimistic about our economic future, believes that we're on the right path and all the indicators are pointing in the right direction. Now, uh, Mr. Bernanke is fully aware that Congress could change that at any time. And I think our responsibility is to make sure that we all work in the same direction so that the full power and strength of the American economy can be, can be uh, generated and that we help Americans uh, prepare for their retirement knowing full well that we have a responsibility in government. Social Security is an extremely valuable program, a program that I will defend and protect, but you also have to have private savings and private retirement. Thank you all very much. I told you, this is gonna be good. We have a mic. Uh, Senator Cardin will take a few questions. And so if anyone wants to come to this standing mic, we'll be able to capture it on the cameras. And while we're coming, I wanted to ask Senator Cardin about the quote that you gave us for our press release, which sort of said why, it answered in some ways the why talk about savings when we've got a job crisis still and much economic woe going on. And I wondered if you could give us some sense no. of why you still feel that subterraneanly, you gave us some reality, uh -huh. not headed to the Rose Garden in 2014, but why, why are these still on the talking points in 2014? And that's an e excellent point. And it, it all has to do with our uh, capacity to uh, invest in this country in job growth. And yes, we do that as government, and that's why we want to get our books in better balance. But we also rely upon personal savings and uh, funds as a source of investment for America's growth. We don't have enough. As a result, we borrow from other countries and borrow from foreign investors, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the other tool that's used is that the Federal Reserve is pumping money into our economy. They have to reverse that, and they are now starting on that reversal. So where do we get the capital to substitute for the money that has to come be paid back, and that is the Fed starting to ease up. What happens if there's international concerns and, we, and some of our sources for international investments change? We need to have resources here in America. And therefore, it's our primary responsibility first, through our savings, to be able to provide the source where capital formation can take place in America. So it, it's not only important for the individual, it's also important for economic growth. And yes, I would acknowledge that when you are in a tough economic time, you want to pump money into the economy. You want to encourage consumption. 
but part of consumption is putting money away for your retirement. I try to convince people of that all the time. I don't care how tough times are, you need to make sure you take care of all of your needs, including your savings needs. Okay, if there are, is it possible that there are no questions? Yes, Justin King, New America. Um, there, there are so many questions. Uh, Senator, thank you for your passion on this. Uh, uh, and, and we all know this is a, a long road to, to improvement. Um, one of the things that you talked about is the issue of people taking money out of their 401, 401k and breaching those accounts. And that's very, very widespread. Um, and, and you talked about doing sort of college and, and health. But the data that we have suggests that most frequently the reason that people break into those accounts is for much more mundane reasons. They run up against debt and bills and everyday expenses that they, that they need to pay. That to me speaks to an underlying lack of emergency and flexible savings in those households. And I think Andrea Lemire from CFPD would, would second that uh, there's a lack of liquid savings as well as retirement savings that's very prevalent among Americans. And I just wonder if you could give us a little bit of insight into uh, in your conversations with the Finance Committee uh, about tax reform. Uh, does the role of emergency and liquid savings uh, come up, uh, and is it something that is a, a part of those discussions? The answer is it does come up. We do talk about this. There is a general acknowledgement that we want retirement money used for retirement, and we want to encourage more retirement options to be lifetime income rather than lump sum. There's conversations about that, and we've had many examples of people who at retirement in their 60s, uh, sell their business, uh, take the money out in a certain number of years, expecting that they will not need it past their 85th birthday, and when they're 86 and they're still healthy, they have no money, and we've talked about that. So, uh, yes, we, we are very much concerned about people breaching uh, their retirement accounts, but here's the politics of it. These plans were developed to make it possible for you to take money out, pay a penalty, but it's possible to take money out. And then we ease the penalties for certain purposes. So we've gone in the wrong direction, and the pressure is usually in the wrong direction. The pressure usually will come, well, gee, we just had a natural disaster. Let's ease up on the rules so that people who are really hurting can get access to their retirement funds in order to take care of this unexpected natural disaster. And it's so hard to vote against that. So we're really moving in the wrong direction. Uh, I think it's unlikely that you will see uh, changes made to existing retirement options that will take away the current flexibility that's in law. I don't think that's a, that's a p uh, politically achievable objective. I think what we can achieve as we develop new tools to make it more, much more um, likely that the funds will go for retirement savings. And we can encourage and offer rewards for key, putting money into lifetime annuity options rather than either ta than taking the money out. So I think all of those, we, I think we, we use more of a carrot than a stick, uh, but if we were rewriting the laws today, it would be dramatically different as far as the ease of being able to take money out for other reasons. Hi, Senator. Hi, how are you? Um, first of all, I want to convey um, Bob Reynolds' warm regards um, and um, you know, thanks for the passion you have on this issue. And then I just want to ask a simple question. Uh, if, if the tax reform you discussed, uh, shifting a chunk of the load toward consumption progressively, if that were to go through, would you still have deferrals for savings against the income tax in the new system? The answer is yes. We, we, we preserve four buckets of deductions from a simplified income tax. One is charitable, one is real estate, one is state and local, and the other is health and retirement. So we, we do preserve four buckets of, of uh, deductions from a simplified income tax that starts at a higher income level. Do we have another question? All right, and well, let, amazingly quiet. Well, let, let me um, uh, again thank you for having this forum. I, we really do need your attention on this. Uh, it, is, it is certainly not a front burner issue today. And as you look at the numbers, it needs to be a front burner issue. And now as we are really starting to focus uh, on the tax code 
and what comes after this omnibus bill. Uh, I think these, the subject is more important than ever, so I would just encourage you. And as you know, we're going to have new leadership on the uh, Finance Committee with Ambassador Baucus leaving us shortly. Uh, so it's, I think, even more important for you all to weigh in now on these issues. And I, I, I really do thank you for your past support and look forward to working with you as we help America deal with this one area where we have not been as strong as we need to be, and that is personal savings and retirement savings. Thank you all very much. So Senator Cardin did exactly what we wanted to do, and he gave us a little hope, uh, which I def definitely appreciate. So uh, Deborah Murphy of AARP, would you please rejoin? We will again have Senator Murphy uh, join us, but let's press on, and I, you are at a powerful point. So. Well, in, in 10 years as a staffer, I know when the boss comes in, everybody else sits down. <laughs> so um, so just to recap, I was saying it's not a crisis, um, but um, the rule of thumb that I have, and the numbers are a little bit less, but about half the population has no access to save through their employer. Half the population have little or no incentive to save for retirement. And so it's not surprising that half the population, when they reach retirement age, actually have nothing set aside. So again, those are sort of rules of thumb, but that does point to we've got a real problem. Uh, and we got solvable fixes on all of those measures. And, and I want to say, even from AARP's perspective, this isn't an old person's issue um, because it's kind of too late for the current retirees. This is an issue for the coming generations that if we don't fix it now and allow um, new solutions and new access and new incentives, um, it's going to be a problem um, throughout the next decade and many decades to come. Um, also, it's a family issue um, because when one part, and you're going to hear from Andrea about different um, areas in which we need to look at savings, not just retirement savings, um, but often people, um, older people are even going into debt um, or taking money out of their 401k that they have saved um, for family member issues, for issues that they need earlier in their lives. Um, so it's a larger issue, and you even heard from Senator Car Cardin, it's an issue for our entire economy. Um, not only do we need those savings to, to spur um, economic growth because they can be used and invested in society, but if people don't have secure consumption over the course of their lives, we also um, don't have a secure economy. Um, that said, um, we have opportunities to make change. And I want to highlight just a few of the areas in which I see um, are relatively low-hanging fruit or there's large agreement that change needs to be made. Um, the first is in the area of access. Um, I won't go into detail about all of the different proposals you heard um, from Senator Hatch about his proposals. There's auto IRAs. But we need to get more employers offering workers the ability to save a little bit each month, um, hopefully even matching that saving or providing additional incentives. Um, the second is incentives to save. Um, we need incentives both through the tax code, through employers offering. We need to keep the incentives we have, but we need to go further. Um, these can be policies like the um, refundable savers credit that you heard um, earlier talked about, um, but we need to make it worth people's while to, to make the tough dis decision to take a little bit out of their paycheck every month. Um, we also need um, education and defaults to make it easy to, pay, to save. And this is both having people understand their needs in retirement. We estimate that it'll cost several hundred thousand dollars just for health care expenses alone in retirement. And that's not even long-term care. And as I said before the break, uh, people on average are saving, if they have anything, less than $44,000. So we need education that, that is, is important. And we need to have the default, and Senator Cardin talked about the um, auto enrollment features that were such an important piece, I think, of, of growing and expanding coverage, but there's more to be done in that area. And the last is choice. So access incentives, education, and now choice. And choice is making sure that people 
um, have the opportunity for good choices within their lives as far as being able to put money aside in a low cost um, vehicle, having the choice of products and services at the outset on um, to create retirement income, and I'll let um, Bob and you heard Senator Hatch talk about ways to do those. So access, incentives, education, and choice. Those are areas in which there's a whole slew of policies that are out there. Um, we do need additional creative ideas, um, but that there, there could be real change. I wanted to mention one thing, because um, as we focus here in Washington, there is a movement, a grassroots movement in the states um, to create real change and advancing the retirement security objectives. So the state of California, for example, and the state of um, of Oregon have already passed legislation looking at ways to take that group of employers that don't offer their workers access to retirement savings and look at ways of pooling those investments. Many other states are following, and I put that out there because um, it's not our preferred way of doing things. Um, we would like to see the entire country um, have access to additional savings, but um, we also hope that this uh, spurs action and, and new ideas and new learning. Um, the last point, and I think we're a little behind session, so, so I will go right to it, um, is that the, the public cares a lot about this issue. This is an issue, as I said, is a ballot box issue um, that um, members of Congress can really go back and say they're doing things for their constituents and for their future. Um, I want to cite one poll, which is that 61% of adults between the age of 44 to 75 said they were more scared about running out of money than they were of dying. More scared of running out of money than they are of dying, 61% of the population. Um, I can cite others about um, how nervous people are about their financial future, but this is a core issue to people when they look at their long lives, as Senator Hatch talked about. Um, so to conclude, the savings policy landscape um, is filled with problems and holes that need your attention. There are solutions out there, and your constituents care about it. So in those three pieces, um, hopefully I've spurned to action, um, and clearly the members of Congress that you've brought up here today, Lisa, have, have taken on that charge and are looking for solutions. So thank Great. you. Thank you, Deb, very much. Appreciate you much. I want to invite Bob Doyle to the podium. We are going to pick up the pace, and Bob, definitely appreciate you standing in. Prudential, as you know, is one of America's largest insurance companies, and we are pleased to have you here today. Well, well th thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, I will say Chris did send me her remarks uh, early this morning, and I will try to do them justice in the uh, few minutes we have, both in terms of content and time. Appreciate uh, it. <laughs> but let me begin by, by thanking uh, Aspen for their commitment to keeping the dialogue on uh, financial security going. Uh, uh, clearly, there is a lot of intelligence and a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity and ideas, uh, many represented by the attendees at this forum and other forums of the Aspen Institute. And it's critical that we all take advantage of those uh, uh, opportunities as, as we come together and discuss these I issues of uh, critical importance. Um, Helping people save enough for a healthy cushion to fund both rainy days and retirement days is a critically important issue for, for all Americans. And even more critical, uh, when you factor in that the possibility that many of today's workers are going to live 20 to 30 years longer uh, than they might have expected or uh, we contemplated. Uh, my remarks uh, will focus on the policy landscape as it relates to saving for those retirement days and what we at Prudential like to call day one and all the days that follow. Uh, we've made, and, and there's been conversation already about the significant strides that have uh, resulted during the last seven years since the enactment of the PPA. Uh, modern plan design effectively using features such as auto enrollment and auto escalation. Uh, clearly, new investment options are becoming available 
uh, on an ongoing basis and in solutions that help uh, ensure that uh, individuals not only save adequately for retirement, but help ensure that the retirement savings uh, last their lifetime. And the private retirement system provides a strong platform for educating and engaging participants in promoting retirement savings. But with half of all workers reporting that they are not or not very confident they will have enough money saved for the comfortable retirement uh, they desire. Uh, there's clearly much more that legislators, regulators, and the industry can do to improve the retirement security for all Americans. We see the coverage gap, savings adequacy, and longevity planning as the biggest risk facing uh, individuals today. Uh, focusing briefly on the coverage gap, uh, as has been mentioned, Far too many workers do not have access to retirement savings in the workplace. Uh, even more striking is when workers do not have access to a plan and when they are asked whether they would embrace a plan with auto enrollment at 3%, just over three quarters say they would continue to contribute a rate, that rate or increase their contributions, leading us to conclude that access is a significant impediment to higher levels of retirement readiness. Uh, Deborah noted that a number of states uh, are starting to look at this savings or retirement coverage gap. They're concerned about the retirement read readiness of all workers and are seeking different solutions to get their citizens on track. And while we applaud those efforts on the part of the states to look into these issues, I think we agree with Deborah that a federal solution is by far and away uh, the preferred approach to, to dealing uh, with these issues. A state-specific approach presents, I think, from our perspective, a number of problems, including uh, losing the economies of scale that uh, a federal regime would offer service providers in terms of accommodating the needs of individual retirement plans. We know that Social Security will not be enough for many workers, and so we need to accelerate the policy making to ease and create and address the coverage gap, particularly for small employers. And to that end, uh, Prudential has long supported the concept of multiple employer plans, or MEPs, as if not the answer, a start toward addressing the uh, inadequacy of access for many of uh, today's American workers. Um, when it comes to savings adequacy, as I've already noted, half of today's workers are not confident that they are saving enough for a comfortable retirement. There are many factors that lead individuals to not saving enough, including having more pressing financial needs or burdens, uh, including debt or medical expenses. But in many cases, it's driven by inertia and the unintended consequences of good regulation. And many simply don't know how to calculate what they need to save during their retirement years. Uh, the good news is that more plant sponsors are beginning to understand the need to draw the link between savings for retirement and living in retirement for their employees and promoting tools to help individuals understand those needs as they begin to think about and should be thinking about uh, at retirement. Importantly, these tools have a real impact. For example, we have consistently found that one in five or 20% of the individuals who, who reach out and utilize our income calculator increase their retirement savings, and typically by an average of 5%. Uh, that is, they save an additional two weeks of salary regardless of their current savings level. From a savings policy perspective, it's clear that the current tax treatment of retirement plan is an important role in driving positive and beneficial behaviors in both plan sponsors and plan participants. And I think we're all should be encouraged by the remarks of Senator Hatch, uh, as well as uh, Senator Cardin, in terms of their commitment to the current retirement system, if not, uh, a and I would add, likely enthusiasm to, to improve upon it. I also mentioned longevity as one of the key risks facing individuals, and in calculating how much individuals need to save for retirement is made even more difficult if they don't realize how long they will be in retirement. Research shows that workers today are increasingly planning to delay retirement, often because they are not financially able to retire, 
However, a large percentage of retirees leave the workforce earlier than planned due to health issues, changes at their company, or having to care for a spouse or family member, among other reasons. And the same pattern holds true for workers planning to work part-time in retirement to supplement their income. While 69% of the workers say they plan to work part-time in retirement, fewer than 25% actually do so. This demonstrates the importance of changing re the retirement conversation. As a country, we focused a lot of attention on accumulation, oriented investment options, rather than recognizing the need to transform account balances into retirement income that will last a lifetime. Currently, only 17% of plan participants report that their employer's retirement savings plan offers an annuity option but more than half think they would use an option when they retire. Our own internal research bears this out. When an in-plan guaranteed income option is added to a defined contribution plan, participant satisfaction and confidence increase, and investors in guaranteed income options contribute on average 38% more than the average 401k participant. That's why we've long advocated uh, that regulators rethink and take another close look at the rules around the selection of annuity providers in an effort to remove uh, clearly identified impediments to employers moving forward with guaranteed income products. We've seen positive impacts of changes that were made to the retirement system in the last decade, but there are still some gaps to close, and with every passing day, we lose an opportunity to improve the retirement security of millions of American workers. We've all heard the number of 10,000 Americans reaching retirement age every day. Uh, we believe everyone, legislators, regulators, and the retirement industry as a whole should maintain a great sense of urgency in dealing with these issues uh, that have such tremendous social impact. And again, we thank Aspen for continuing their dialogue on these important issues. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. I want to thank Bob and Prudential. Prudential taught me three words about this whole field of, of retirement, coverage, adequacy, and longevity. So if you need cliff notes, uh, remember those. I want to welcome Senator Murphy to Aspen and to this briefing. Senator, we are thankful that you could join us. Senator Murphy was elected to the Senate in 2012 and serves on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee. Prior to his election to the Senate, he served as Connecticut's uh, representative from the 5th Congressional S uh, District for three terms in the House. We hear tell you have an interest and passion for savings, and we're so thankful you could join us today. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, to Lisa and to Colby and to the Aspen Institute for inviting me uh, here uh, today. Um, I do indeed have a great interest in uh, savings, maybe in part because uh, I uh, represent a new generation of senators, um, a generation, frankly, that doesn't necessarily believe that all of the programs that have historically supported people in their retirement are going to be there when they retire. I, I am the youngest member of the Senate, which is, which is a very low bar, uh, to be honest <laughs> with you. But, um, but I really wanted to come here today, and I think Senator Cardin, Senator Hatch, as members of the Finance Committee, as senior members of the Senate, have probably laid out for you the landscape with respect to their committee's agenda and some of the programs that we have been constantly debating. I really wanted to come here and talk to you. Um, about the importance of infusing into this debate some new ideas in terms of how we can build a new culture around savings. Um, and I sort of just want to begin um, with uh, um, a recognition that we have begun a renewed conversation in this Senate and in this country about the issue of poverty. Maybe it's because we're uh, on the 50-year anniversary of uh, LBJ's war on poverty, but you see on both sides of the aisle uh, members of Congress speaking up and talking about the importance of taking on the issue of poverty. I live in the richest state in the nation, but it's a state in which one in four kids go to bed every night hungry. I uh, spent a day over the Christmas break with a 
guy just about my age, 40 years old, um, who has worked his entire life, all 40 years of it. He's had ups and downs, but he finds himself at 40 years old homeless for the first time in his life. And um, this guy allowed me to uh, spend essentially a day of his life with him as he essentially went from the homeless shelter to the Dunkin Donuts to the New Haven Library just trying to find a way to stay warm and um, <clears throat> this guy who sort of I've come to call Nick as a pseudonym as I've talked about him over the past few weeks um, is a perfect example of our challenge. It is not frankly that people don't want to save, it's that in a world in which wages have remained flat over the last 20 years, increasingly families and individuals find themselves in poverty, on the edge of poverty, in Nick's case actually homeless for the first time in his life, um, and they are unable uh, to save. It certainly isn't part of their consciousness because more families' consciousness today is just about survival than it ever has been before, but they also don't have the means. Um, and so I, I want to be part of uh, Congress that protects existing routes for private savings. It's why I've been such uh, a champion, for instance, uh, of the idea that um, as you get your uh, statements about how much you're putting into retirement, that you're actually disclosed as to how much money that's going to turn out to be when you retire. It's why I'm a protector of things like Social Security and Medicare as pieces of that stool. But I want to talk to you today about uh, an idea that isn't brand new, um, but I think an idea whose time has come, and that's the uh, idea that is no stranger to Aspen and CFED and others who have worked with it, but it's the idea of um, child trust funds. Um, in uh, different places, they're called child trust funds, they're called baby bonds. Um, in the current U.S. debate, they're uh, now referred to as children's savings accounts, or C. Uh, essays. And I think it's frankly a model that it's time for this Congress to revisit. Um, the idea is pretty straightforward. At birth, every child is deeded with a private savings account, and each account is equipped with a very small initial deposit. The account grows over time. Uh, the account holder or their family members can put money in as time goes on. And when the child reaches 18, or it could be 21 years old, the account matures, and it can be used by the account holder and no one else to fund a major life expense, such as a college education or a home. And what happens is that it, as this account grows, the child learns about the value of savings, and they're provided with a small stake in their financial future. Um, and this is a account that's going to belong to that child and the child alone. While the relatives can contribute to it, the balance is only going to be accessible to that child. And what Bruce Ackerman, who's a very well-known professor at Yale University, a friend and constituent, talks about is that it would be a, a component of developing what he terms as a stakeholder society, whereby individuals have a personal stake in their future and bind people to their community. You know, the power of these things, they're not theoretical. They're actually working right now in San Francisco and in Nevada and Cuyahoga County, Ohio. Um, these child savings accounts aren't just a policy idea. They're actually a reality for tens of thousands of children. Great Britain um, experimented with this idea. The recent move to austerity has caused them to shelve it. But there are five million young British citizens who are right now adding to and growing their child savings account as we speak. And, uh, you know, I'm agnostic as to exactly how we approach it, as to whether um, at the outset maybe it begins as a pilot program, but we know that if we want to increase savings behavior, it makes sense to teach children the value um, early on. This is an idea that's actually gotten a decent amount of bipartisan support. Um, Senators Rick Santorum and Jim DeMint have supported this idea in the past. In fact, Senator Santorum uh, and Senator Corzine um, a couple of Congresses ago introduced it. My One of my predecessors, Chris Dodd, was a big champion of this. Senator Schumer supports it now. Senator Clinton, um, when she was on the campaign trail, talked about it a lot. Now, it's not free, obviously. Um, if you're going to do a $500 account at birth, it's going to cost you upwards of about $2 billion a year, and that money is not easy to come by in a sequester 
uh, cash-strapped Washington. Um, but it's worth at least talking about um, because it's not enough just to teach kids about the value of savings. Um, it is a wholly different thing for them to actually experience it. Um, it doesn't do much good to give a kid a driver's license if they don't actually have a car, right? And that, I think, is the discussion that we have to have. How early on can you provide financial literacy to children so they have the idea of savings ingrained in their brain, but then also find a pretty innovative way to actually have them experience savings. Now, $2 billion is a lot of money, but frankly, that's the amount of, you know, just a handful of outdated weapon systems in the Department of Defense budget, and I think a lot of us could make an argument that if you can enact culture change on the issue of how kids and young adults think about savings, that's probably a worthwhile trade. Um, and I think in this environment in which we are now all talking about this issue of poverty at a different level, um, as we grapple with what new ideas can we put forward to try to make young adults and families think about savings at a moment when they just don't have the oxygen to think about that issue, when they have lost the ability for their employers to contribute uh, to their retirement future, um, and when there simply isn't the money around to do it, this, I think, is something uh, whose time has come, and I know it's frankly something that the Aspen Institute has thought uh, a lot about. So um, I, I'm, I'm encouraged that this has historically been a bipartisan issue. I've been just beginning some conversations with uh, my colleagues on the floor of the Senate to see if there is any appetite to, can, to start to build a conversation around this idea. But I think that the challenge for this conference and others is to you know, talk about the here and now of retirement policy and tax policy and policy related to life insurance and entitlement programs, but to also spend a little bit of time thinking about some new things as well. And so uh, I'm thrilled to uh, be able to join you uh, this morning um, and look forward to, uh, to a partnership with a lot of great thinkers uh, in this room. Thank you very much for having me. Senator Murphy is willing to take a question, so do we have one from the audience? I'm, I'm getting the hook from the staff. Is there a question that I can ask? Can I ask one question sure. myself? As a person, you've made my year. I would start a savings landscape a discussion with also thinking about savings at birth. Can you give us your reaction to, you spent time with a homeless constituent. And how do you still talk about savings, and even savings for poor kids, when you give these new ideas? How can you hold the ideas in the same breath, you know, that you've seen distress, and yet you're very interested in a new savings vehicle? How do you hold yeah, those two? Ideas? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's not easy, because the, the underlying issue here is just a lack of wealth and a lack of purchasing power within the middle class and within the, the growing number of poor families. And it's just, it's really difficult to preach savings to them or come up with innovative private sector saving vehicles if they just don't have the money to do it. So, you know, listen, that is why I think this is all interrelated. We tend to compartmentalize policy far too much, but, you know, there's a, a lot of us who are really interested in this conversation about either, um, extension of unemployment benefits or an increase in the minimum wage because we really believe that one of the best ways to provide for private sector savings is to actually put money into the hands of the lower middle class and the poor in particular who right now just don't have the money to do it. And we can dream up all of these innovative ideas and tax incentives all we want, but if people don't have the money to put away, they're not going to put it uh, away. And so part of this idea is actually giving people real money. I mean, if you put $500 in a bank account for a child and you assume a very small annual additional uh, ad uh, amount of money, let's say $50 a year for the first 18 years, that's $4,000 at age 18. Now in Connecticut, if a kid wants to go to a state university um, with a Pell Grant and with some financial aid, $4,000 goes a long way to paying for a couple of years of college. That is a sizable amount of money even in a place like Connecticut. So um, I think the, the, the first challenge is putting uh, you know, money into the in, into these into these families' pockets, um, and then 
and this is frankly, you know, one relatively innovative, cost-effective means to do it. And what we know is that when you do put this money up front, um, it is much more likely for the family to contribute after then. So for families that might actually have $50 a year or $100 a year or $200 a year, um, they're much more likely to actually take that money and put it away if there has been an, 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 an initial investment made because it's not just financial literacy for the kid, it's financial literacy for the, uh, for the family as well. And what we know is there's this cycle of poverty, but there is also a cycle of financial um, illiteracy, um, that if if a parent doesn't understand the importance of saving, then the child is not going to understand the importance, and this is a way to really involve the whole family. Thank All right. you, Senator Thank you, Lisa. Murphy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you again. S Senator, this is really great. I think, Senator Murphy, if you had been here to hear the other senators, you would have known you've got some good colleagues who want to work on this. We're going to close with Andrea LaVere of CFED, and we could not ask for a better closer because all of the issues that Andrea's worked on for so many years have been raised today, and I appreciate you being here, Andrea. So only once before have I had a tougher act, which is when I had to give uh, remarks after the extraordinarily handsome former mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, and I had to keep the crowd there. So, but then I also have to thank Senator Murphy for doing my job for me. So I want to thank Lisa, my dear friend and colleague. I want to thank my two fellow panelists who are so wonderful. Um, and I want to make a transition between the retirement and some other uses of funds by telling a short little story about my son who's now in medical school. And two years, uh, uh, he's in his third year, and right before he started, one of my friends came up to him and said, Alex, if you go into geriatrics, I'll pay part of your tuition. <laughs> and the wise 23-year-old looked at her and said, we're all going to be in geriatrics. <laughs> <laughs> so therein lies the truth of where we're going. So um, we've talked about savings, and um, a core part of this whole conversation is that what we've learned over the last two decades is that if you want to build financial security, you can't just stop at income. You must affirmatively build all types of household assets. And the phrase we always use is that it's not just what you earn, it's also what you own. In two weeks, CFED will be releasing the 2014 Assets and Opportunity Scorecard. It is the most comprehensive benchmarking tool in the country about how each state builds and protects the assets of its residents. You are going to get the first sneak preview. <laughs> the new metric we created last year, um, liquid asset poverty, is going to show that for the second year in a row, 44% of American households, which is almost half the nation, live in a state of liquid asset poverty. This means that they do not have the savings, which is conservatively measured at $5,875 for a family of four, necessary to live at the poverty level for three months if their main source of income is disrupted. This is how Senator Murphy's friend probably ended up homeless. Or in the words of TV station KERA in Dallas, which has adopted this idea of liquid asset poverty, 44% of American families live one crisis away from financial cat catastrophe. And it is savings that make all the difference for these families, 89% of whom are employed and almost half of whom have some college. So if we want to reduce financial insecurity, as everybody has said today, we need policies that incent savings. We've heard extensively from everyone from Senator Hatch on down that the tax code is very effective in supporting retirement. In 2013, $137 billion in tax expenditures contributed to support pensions. We also know that this support is concentrated at the top. As the Congressional Budget Office told us last year, these expenditures tilt heavily towards the wealthiest. In fact, the level of concentration is extreme 
the top 1% of households receive double the benefit of the entire bottom 40% combined. But as we also heard today from Senator Cardin, the Savers Credit is an exception. The Savers Credit is one of the powerful incentives that really help low and moderate income savers. The program today costs about a billion dollars. And if you think about that, that's a really small portion of the 137 billion that we spent. We need congressional support to improve the savers credit. That's already been spoken. I just want to reemphasize the fact that for most of the lower income households, having a deduction doesn't help you. You need a refundable tax credit. And that's where we need to go. We have several congressmen who are supporting this. We need the Senate to do this as well. But as you heard so powerfully from Senator Murphy, we can't just focus on retirement. We need to build financial security from the start. Because one of the things that we know, which Senator Murphy did not focus on, is that savings build aspirations. What we call it is hope in concrete form. CFED, along with many other partners, sponsored a national demonstration with children's savings accounts. We found in one of our demonstration sites of five Head Start centers with 500 kids that the majority of parents had given up on their children going to college by age three. And they had given up because they never believed they could afford it. And the tragedy was that most of them had the wrong view of how much college would cost. They assumed that they would have to spend what an upper middle class person would have to spend to go to Harvard, and they had no sense of what Senator Murphy just said if you went to a public university with a Pell Grant and with savings. So what we've discovered over a decade of experimentation with children's savings accounts is that small investments turn into big life changes. And even small savings have big impacts. There's been a lot of research, I'm just gonna recount one data point it is that low and moderate income students with less than $500 save for college are three times more likely to enroll and four times more likely to graduate. We also know that the current savings and scholarship programs we have are inadequate. My dear friend Michael Lomax, who's the head of the United Negro College Fund, which is the largest scholarship providers in the nation, heard me talk about children's savings accounts and came up to me and said, you are the answer to my problems, which was very frightening. And he said, scholarships alone don't work anymore. We don't have enough money. We get to these kids too late. The kids have no efficacy in the decision and they're dropping out because of the financial insecurity of their household, not necessarily for the reasons we thought a decade ago, which is they aren't prepared to go to college. Too many of our tax incentives for college, like our tax incentives for retirement, are balanced, unbalanced for low-income people. 529s and Coverdales disproportionately help higher-income families and their children. Families who use 529s have about 25 times the wealth of those that don't. And while we all know that there is no silver bullet to end poverty, by starting with children, we have discovered that CSAs can benefit the entire family. They have encouraged parents to get banked and to save, to further their own educations, and to set the entire household on the route to greater financial security. My favorite phrase is that parents will do for their children what they won't do for themselves. And so it really has a magnified benefit in many ways, but we need federal policy to help. I love Senator Murphy's idea of a big bill. I'm gonna give you smaller things that we can do. So there's two big opportunities that we wanna focus on. The first is the Higher Education Act reauthorization. As the HELP Committee considers this reauthorization, we really wanna see how they can promote college savings as one strategy for improving Pell and expanding college access and success. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the report on reinventing Pell that came out from the College Board. One of the fabulous things they recommend is to bring Pell down to middle school, because that helps build aspirations and education, and to connect it to a savings account. And right at that time, incredible power and the ability to perhaps ensure that Pell is used more effectively so the percentage, the high percentage of kids who never graduate with the Pell Grant won't be as serious an issue. 
We also want to encourage innovation in child savings with proposals like the American Dream Accounts Act, which help students prepare for college by creating online accounts with a savings component. Second is tax reform. As we think about tax reform, we should really think about how do we build children's savings account into that? What if not only did we make the savers credit refundable, but we expanded it to cover deposits in educational savings accounts? And what if we took the existing models of states like Colorado of transforming or reforming some of the 529 programs to be more friendly to low-income families with matches, with relationship with the bank, so if they're unbanked, they can go right into an actual place and open an account and provide financial education? And what if we simplified the higher education tax credit and provided tax-based college savings supports for families? So let's show all the skeptics don't believe that we can do something that we actually can think about how to rebuild the opportunity structure in America. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming. I think uh, this panel delivered exactly what we asked for, which was inspiration about the landscape that's ahead of us in 2014. Uh, fear not, this is a Congress that's thinking, and I think the senators who came really demonstrated uh, the thoughts that are out here for improving our savings system. Please join me in thanking our panel again, and thank you all. Thank you.